our first speaker is Caitlin Regere, um, and she is the host of a uh, Canadian television show called Rebound, and she's also a PhD student at King's College London. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah. Okay. So over the course of the next 20 minutes, um, I'm going to examine the traditional narrative surrounding American burlesque and the concept that's been proposed by a lot of members of the burlesque community and scholars that look at burlesque. Um, and I'm going to question this, this concept that it died at some point in the midsection of the 20th century. And I'm going to do this through interviews that I've conducted with burlesque dancers who danced in the 1950s and the 1960s. And so I'll question um, this argument of, burlesque, uh, of the death of burlesque and also this argument that burlesque is distinct from the evolution of contemporary exotic dance. Okay, I know we have a lot of burlesque experts in uh, the crowd today, um, but just to kind of give a, uh, a, a little bit of a, of a background here, scholarship has traditionally categorized this performance form into three historic periods or booms. So the first boom was sparked by British music hall dancer Lydia Thompson, and it refers to combinations of singing and dancing and periods of plays that flourished in, in the late 19th century in uh, the northeast of the US. The second boom, which when we think of burlesque, this tends to be the period that we're thinking of. Um, it's kind of been labeled the golden age of burlesque. It reached its peak in the 1930s when burlesque moved into historic Broadway theaters. And it's, it's kind of famed by dancers such as Gypsy Rose Lee and comics such as W.C. Fields. Then, often written into our burlesque history, after this boom, this period, is the death of burlesque, okay? And it's normally looked at as a dark age, um, from which, in the 1990s, the third boom, or the burlesque revival, uh, emerged from which is kind of currently ongoing, and this period is somewhat two-pronged. It partly connotes the low burlesque artists crossing over into art theaters um, for either cultured or counterculture audiences, and it simultaneously refers to the gentrification and commodification of the entertainment into fashion, women's recreation, and the middle-class consciousness. Now, I myself am very much a part of this resurgence, my first job out of uh, theater school was that as a burlesque expert on a TV show. How do I play it? No. Oh, you know what you always have, you always have to save it from the movie file onto the. Oh, because it was on my laptop. Yeah. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> so you don't get to see me as a burlesque expert. <laughs> Uh, but if this was playing, you would see me as a burlesque expert um, on television. And so the strange thing about TV is that once you're labeled an expert, you are one. So I then began to lecture, um, I, not lecture, I then began to teach workshops, appear on daytime talk shows, speaking from my place of neo-expertise. I lectured on the importance of the garter belt and the post-post feminist narrative, and like so many burlesquers, I argued for the distinction between the historic burlesque house and the low demeaning strip club. And then I realized that my life was a sham. Through my experience in the neo-burlesque community, I had the privilege to work very closely with a group of women who were burlesque queens in the latter half of the second boom and who continued to perform during this period in question the death of burlesque. And these women often attend events and festivals held by the neo community. And this relationship is mutually beneficial uh, for the neo community having a legend of burlesque there, as they call them, legitimizes the historical underpinnings of the movement. Okay? For the legend, she gets to be called a legend, and in turn, she gets to tell tales of former glory, which may or may not evolve to be more and more glorious upon retelling. So by examining interviews I've held with these women at both neo-burlesque events and in more personal setting, I've begun to explore the public memory of burlesque versus the lived experiences of these dancers. And specifically, I've begun to question the death of burlesque and the eventual dark age from which the burlesque resurgence has been revived. <laughs> 
So a common narrative within the contemporary understanding of burlesque history is its devised in some point of the middle part of the uh, 20th century and then the rebirth of the performance form in the 1990s. And this is from a few things. Bernard Stubble, who wrote about this in actually the late 1950s, suggests that it eventually met its death due to financial difficulties arriving from the increasing demands of the stagehand union, um, inability to compete with motion picture prices, and he also looks at the more revealing fashion trends um, as making the burlesque house less appealing. Rachel Steer, in her chapter entitled Who Killed Striptease, states that one of the last burlesque houses closed in Kansas City in 1969, and she points to three changing cultural forces. She points to feminism, the sexual revolution, and porn. And many contemporary scholars are in agreement that porn, the sexual revolution, and feminism are important in understanding the shifts in burlesque as a performance form. Um, for some, burlesque may have seemed to be a throwback to a previous decade representing sexual repression and sexual hypocrisy, and for others, burlesque may have been a more tangible representation of either systemic um, or overt women's oppression. However, are these shifts in public perception the same as a death? Is it perhaps an overly simplistic and somewhat fragmented telling of this history? Now, Robert C. Allen, who wrote arguably the most fundamental text on uh, burlesque history of horrible prettiness, explain, argues that the um, death of burlesque began as early as the 1930s. And he explains that when the mayor of New York, uh, LaGuardia, um, carried out his personal war against burlesque, in which he, he refused any licenses to any theaters who used the term burlesque in any way, um, whether it be on a marquee uh, or in any of in any of their pamphlets or anything, um, and in that and that and by doing that, he actually drove burlesque off Broadway, out of middle class consciousness, and out of New York City. And although burlesque continued in cities outside of New York, Allen suggests that the core of the industry had been eradicated. And he says that when burlesque stopped there, it left the body of the industry brain dead. And it was only a matter of a few years before burlesque passed from the scene entirely except as a misleading signifier for nightclub strip shows. Okay, so let's think through this idea of a misleading signifier. Um, through my friendships in the burlesque community, uh, I spend a lot of time with dancers who danced uh, in the 1950s and the 1960s and who moved very freely between the burlesque theaters and the strip clubs of that time. Um, so. Could what Alan describes as a passing simply be the natural adaptation and evolution of the entertainment form? So April March, who danced from 1952 until 1978, performed in both theaters and nightclubs until her retirement at the age of 43. And she says that even well into the 70s, I was dancing in theaters, but the theaters were ending, and I would open clubs or theaters for Stan Shaker, who I worked for in Miami in 1960. In the last place I worked with the Silver Slipper nightclub in Washington, D.C., but I also worked at a theater called the Palace Theater. And April performed her same stocking strip routine in all of these locations for the entirety of her career with the same choreography and same music, regardless of venue. Um, Alexandra the Great 48, who's named for her bra size, <laughs> um, began her career in New, in New York clubs and then speaks of moving on to the theater circuit. I was in the clubs before that and then she, Rose LaRose, a former dancer turned producer, put me in the theaters, which is where you make your money and your name. It's harder work, but Tiffany Carter, who danced at the same time, also moved between the two, but actually preferred the clubs to the theaters. I danced in clubs and theaters. I preferred the clubs much more. The hours were always the same in the evenings. At the theaters, you would work pretty much all day starting at noon, and the shows would be spread out all, all during the day until midnight. Also, I liked the atmosphere in the clubs more. Some of the theaters were really raunchy. The guys would jack off. Yeah, you heard that right. Jack off right in the front rows, widely exposed, and no one would stop them. It was horrible. I would have to psych myself out to do a show to do a show in front of them sometimes. I would say to myself, if I can save one child from being raped today, then so be it. And that would get me through. Not all of them, but some of them. 
So Irving Zeidman, um, who published The American Burlesque Show in 67, writes from his place as a 1960s burlesque patron. And in this quote, we see that although the comedy routines may be no longer effective, the focus of burlesque has shifted solely to the dancers. He says, since there's no influx of new male performers in burlesque, the old faces, and they're really old, are now reappearing one after another in a harrowing procession. The comics look as ancient as their jokes. Age has withered their customed and sailed their infinite, and staled their infinite vulgarities. The girls are mainly new. The most recent crop of busty favorites diligently advertising the exact dimension of their billowy breasts, with their not in, which they're not adverse to display in slow or rapid motion up and down and sideways. Finally, burlesque without the comedians, straight men, singers, chorus, or scenery, just the strippers, has managed to survive in all girl nightclubs as a burlesque after dark. So Zyman is suggesting that although the comedy routines might be dying, burlesque was continuing in a new and altered form by way of the dancers. So can we then assume, as Zeidman and the aforementioned dancers suggest, that burlesque did not die, but rather the venues, the props, the comics, the perform predominant entertainment form um, through which women per uh, perform striptease changed and lived as a burlesque after dark? That is to say, is the standard narrative surrounding burlesque history somewhat fragmented and potentially overly sim simplistic? If many of the dancers perform similar numbers and move between theaters and strip clubs, how can we not see the strip club as an extension of burlesque? Why has contemporary burlesque resurgence written in a dark age from which the performance has been um, reinstated? And I sat beside um, Dr. Lynn Sally, us both facing the mirror as she put on three sets of false lashes to paint on her neo-burlesque persona, Dr. Lucky. And I asked Dr. Sally why burlesque had to have died. And she said, I don't think burlesque quote unquote died, though I know most scholars argue that. I disagree with it. I think it's this part of glorifying or over glorifying what really happened in the 40s and 50s. It's like there was this attempt to disassociate burlesque from commercial stripping. At the Burlesque Hall of Fame weekend this summer, Joe Boobs Weldon of the New York School of Burlesque took the biggest stage. When people ask me the difference between burlesque and stripping, I say a stripper would never ask the difference between burlesque and stripping. <laughs> I sat in the audience next to April March, the first lady of burlesque, who squeezed my hand with discomfort. The 78-year-old doesn't like the word stripping. Um, but rather wants to be remembered for her ladylike act by the new generation. And traditionally, a major tenet of the burlesque revival is the concerted effort made to dissociate from stripping. This distinction allows women who take my classes, for example, to view the activity as cultured or historically rich, rather than exploitative and blue collar. For performers, the term burlesque often connotes self-awareness, empowerment, and personal agency. Um, as British pop culture commentator uh, Caitlin Moran says, Watching good burlesque in action, you can see female sexuality, a performance constructed with the value system of a woman instead of an uncomfortable half-hidden erection in the dark. <laughs> and this sentiment um, is echoed by a, a lot of academic literature surrounding the neo-burlesque movement. Because by maintaining this distinction between stripping and burlesque, we, the resurgents, are further removed from the possible sociological problems associated with striptease. Through differentiating neo-burlesque performers and audiences from stripper, strippers and strip club audiences, we're potentially able to sidestep debates about uh, objectification and exploitation that often sit at the heart of a lot of literature surrounding exotic dance. So as Claire Nally states, when looking at contemporary burlesque shows, the very um, diversity of performances, straight, queer, vintage, fetish, throughout the country and indeed the world, as well as the complexity of audience demographics and responses, suggest that any simplistic reading of empowerment or patriarchal domination should be withheld. Now, Nally's argument is valid assuming that we regard the burlesque resurgence as something separate from mainstream burlesque of the past and its subsequent evolution into strip clubs. 
And this distinction between burlesque dancer and stripper is really new. And it's only relevant today within asserting the neo-burlesque as a distinct movement. Tiffany Carter, who began performing in the 1960s, does not describe herself as a burlesque dancer, but rather a stripper who happened to be performed in burlesque shows. In my day, I was a stripper. To me, burlesque is a group of performances. You had comedy, magic, fire, some belly dancing, and strippers are a part of burlesque, but for the most part, I was a stripper. Now this transformation of burlesque has relied on the dis distinction between burlesque and stripping. And this distinction has been made possible by history. History has provided a selective nostalgic lens through which to view burlesque. The women are no longer dancing. The men are no longer gazing. We are not confronted with that living reality, which may or may not be palatable. For many of us, myself included, the thought of a burlesque dancer with a mink stole and her mobster boyfriend feels very different than an exotic dancer with loose neck heels and her uh, strip club owner boyfriend. And we're able to enjoy the former image through this historic veneer. The latter is present and accessible and therefore exposes issues we may find morally problematic or we might issue judgment over. And I'm going to give you an example of this. This is a long quote, so just bear with me. Um, but this is April again, and she's speaking of the negative incident she experienced in, the sh in Chicago in 1956. I met a gangster. I don't remember his name, but I think he took over Al Capone's mob. But anyway, it was time for me to leave. My contract was expiring, and they said I wasn't leaving. And I said, yes, I am. And they said, no, I wasn't. And some other girls, they told me that I had better listen, because over in Sirico, the girls that didn't do what they were told and tried to leave had acid thrown in their faces and stuff like that. And the way I got out of there was this young cop helped me. He told me every night, take a little piece of wardrobe, take something with me, but the last night, leave an old costume so that they wouldn't know I was leaving permanently. So I went and I picked up my dog and the rest of my luggage and he, the cop, gave me a little box of no-dose pills and a thermos of black coffee. And he said, drive and don't stop until you get to Oklahoma City. So that's what I did. And that was my exit out of Chicago. I used to think Chicago, that that was all comic book stuff. But it really wasn't. That's what went, back, that, that's what went on back in those days. I never returned to Chicago to work again. In fact, I've never been back to Chicago, except the airport. So April's story, though horrific, is still veiled in a sort of faded glamour as she casually mentions Al Capone or leaving an old showgirl costume in a dressing room. And we might be enticed by the inherent historicism or nostalgia of the story, and thus the brutality becomes subsidiary. And this image leaves for many of us a lot to the imagination, and thus there's room for personal choice and selection. Time graces the story, the circumstances, the dancer, and allows us, the recipients, more creativity in our ways of remembering or interpreting it. It's through these means that the burlesque revival has been able to reinterpret, transform, and glamorize burlesque. And through this reinterpretation, the neo-burlesque community, as Cheryl Dodds has noted, has created a space that includes and celebrates marginalized body types, questions gender norms, um, but on the flip side, the neo community has not been terribly inclusive of class diversity. That's to say that unlike the burlesque of the past or its contemporary counterpart, exotic dance, neo burlesque is somewhat of a luxury in that the performers have the necessary income to enable them to produce performances that challenge, negotiate, and reimagine the striptease body. So in December of 2010, the, the Guardian published a story entitled Burlesque is Stripping for Posh People. And the article suggested that neo-burlesque is not empowering or liberating, and that in fact it's simply stripping packaged and sold to middle class professionals. And this st statement is of course only negative if we see stripping as solely negative. The current, and this, this current discussion isn't about power dynamics or objectification versus emancipation theory in contemporary strip clubs. There's lots of fine work done on that. But it's, however, crucial to note that such debates and prejudices exist in understanding why this distinction between burlesque and stripping and the subsequent broken timeline has been so important to this burlesque community. 
The burlesque resurgence, its dancers, scholars, enthusiasts alike, have traditionally moved, removed burlesque from the stripping continuum in order to engage artistic value and be perceived as liberating and in line with the goals of the mainstream women's movement. This has allowed the community to set, select portions of history that they find useful. In addition, the ways in which they've reinterpreted burlesque has allowed dancers who may have been perceived as marginal figures in the 50s and 60s to be praised by the burlesque community as feminist icons. However, the burlesque of the past and the women who danced it, the legends, have arguably much more in common with contemporary exotic dancers than they do with the neo-burlesque community. What leaves to be seen is whether the neo-burlesque community can close this class divide and honor and support strippers both past and present. Wonderful. Thank you so much, um, Caitlin. I just wonder, um, while it's kind of very fresh in our minds, whether we want to ask a few questions now. Um, do you think anyone wants to ask anything? Yeah. Um, thank you, Caitlin. That was kind of really entertaining as well. That was my first ever talk. <laughs> um, something that kind of stood out to me in your research is actually your use of temporal notions of popular. Mm -hmm. So I think just you were used word arrival, resurgence, death, iron fad, but passing, survival, mm -hmm. and and how you've got this constant stream of something called burlesque, but how it has this, this stunted timeline effectively going through it. Um, it's just more of a noticing that, really, yeah. actually, and that's quite interesting in how we're historicising popular darts and how it has a, it's a journey, effectively, through mm -hmm. this idea of stopping and then starting and then restarting and becoming something else. Um, yeah, is that something that's occurred to you at all, or is that... Um, no, but I like that. I think that fits in with the kind of the nostalgia of it all. You know, this this idea of yeah, that this idea of birth and death and and that and that, that, that creating those kind of clear transitions um, allows us to gaze nostalgically. Mm -hmm. But that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just on the idea of faded glamour and obviously the popular side of of a nostalgic era, I was thinking of um, Boardwalk Empire. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the HBO series, mm -hmm. um, just in uh, talking about Chicago and yeah. and the, the glamorizing of that era, even though it's ridiculously violent and all the rest yeah. of it, but it's it's yeah. being it's picky and choosy about the parts you see and then the parts yeah. that you want to revive and take yeah. on. So in the in the extended version of this paper, I actually have a dancer who was dancing in two thousand and three in Chicago. And I compare their negative experiences, uh, which is really interesting. Because actually, her in 2003, her negative experiences are coming from patrons that then the bouncers of the club or the institution of the club protect her from. Whereas in 53, the threat is actually coming from the institution. Does that make sense? Yeah. Which is arguably more dangerous. Question. Sorry, were you wanting? Yeah, good point. I was interested in what you're saying about how the distinction between burlesque and stripper has been quite a recent distinction. And um, I was wondering, do you think that's arised, or did that arise before the neo movement or because of the neo movement? And could you just elaborate a bit more about um, who made that distinction, if there were individuals or society or media, um, and maybe how it began? Yeah, um, I think that, uh, and Charles can speak to this as well, but I think that the neo movement, um, you know, when it was emerging in the 90s, it's, it was really emerging um, primarily as performance art, and that we have the, the, the more gentrified, I actually really wish the clip from my show had worked because it's super gentrified, like this is like made, like, primetime television in which I'm teaching apparently burlesque, right? But it's like, it's really, really gentrified. And so that, that um, I actually think that there's two movements within that. You have the performance art neo movement that kind of started emerging, and then after that we get the more gentrified 
um, you know, which kind of has really reached its peak now with like the Christine Aguilera movie, right, where it, which is a PG rated film about burlesque. Um, and so that, that, so I think that in the beginning days of the neo movement, that distinction um, was maybe more apparent and maybe a little bit less relevant to the performance artists. Um, but it definitely, as it's moved more and more and needed to be more and more gentrified, that distinction has needed to be made very clearly. And it's a distinction I get asked in, in my pop, pop work. It's a distinction I get asked to make constantly to remind people that burlesque is empowering and stripping is not. It strikes me that you're making some really important arguments about the need to look at popular dance within its very precise moments of um, production and consumption in a way that's sort of historically located. Um, given that, you know, one of your arguments is that the same dancers are doing the same acts but across so many different kind of contexts of production and um, sort of ways that, of, of consuming them as well. And I think that comes across really clearly. But one of the things I wanted to ask was yet another distinction which I think is loaded with value and, and complicates ideas around burlesque. And I don't know if this, this distinction is one that has comes up in, in the US and Canada. I've definitely come across it within the, the British, mm -hmm. the current burlesque scene. And it's, it's the difference between artists who are burlesque artists and neo-burlesque. Yes. And there's a group of um, people who are the burlesque artists, so typically it would be someone like a Modesty Blaze or our woman in the US, uh, and Dina Vantiva, the editor of Vantiva, because you know, what they're claiming to do is work within a particular tradition, some of their acts are modelled on these sort of original acts, and, and, and they um, think they are, that they are working very much within that tradition, whereas the, the and not everyone goes with this distinction, but the, there are also the neo-burlesque artists who are the ones who say in some way they rub up against it and they challenge that in a variety of ways, whether it's through costume or the nature of the act or the performance mode in all kinds of ways. Yeah. So even within the, this current scene, yeah. and not everyone subscribes to this, but I have heard this argument, yeah. and I think that is just another set of complications and it values, is. and I don't know if it's something you can speak to at all. Or yeah, I it. definitely see the distinction. Mm -hmm. I mean, even if you attend um, the Miss Exotic World pageant, which I do, um, in Vegas every year, which is kind of the, for the American burlesque scene, the moment, um, and they have an award for most classic, mm -hmm. which is a separate award. Um, and they traditionally haven't enjoyed the really, um, I don't want to say out there, but the, 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 re the less conventional performance mm -hmm. art, and they do make that distinction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so yeah, I mean, if we can look at the Burlesque Hall of Fame as somehow, you know, um, I, I don't know if we can, because the Burlesque Hall of Fame has a really interesting history in itself, I don't know if you know too much about it, but... It's Dixie Evans's. Well, not anymore. Oh, it was right. taken from Dixie. Oh, okay. We can go into that. It's, it's, right. it's been yeah. quite tumultuous. But if we can look at the Burlesque Hall of Fame as kind of the moderator somehow for this, yeah. they they do make that distinction. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that that is it. I think there's, in some ways, I almost think that there's three things. That there is the neo burlesque movement, which is, tends to be very performant arts-based in and then there is the um, people who are uh, ascribing to a more classical performance form. Mm -hmm. And then there's also then just the whole recreational movement, mm -hmm. which isn't tends not to be about the removal of clothing. Mm -hmm. It tends to be like, let's look at a stocking strip. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's the really, really safe and gentrified version. And I would almost say that those are three separate things. Mm -hmm. But all sit within this umbrella of the resurgence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's really yeah. complex, I think. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm just interested in your use of this word gentrification, and yeah. you'd, and you've met, and I think in response to one of the other questions, you've mentioned Christina Aguilera in relation to oh. that, and, and I, I suppose I've thought of her as a kind of mainstreaming of burlesque. So I'm 
people who know. Well, so I'm wondering just how you're using the word. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know, have you seen the film? Yeah. Okay, so um, to me, that's the cleaned up version of burlesque. Mm -hmm. That it's a very clean, very palatable, there's no removal of clothing. There's, I think, an idea in popular culture that burlesque isn't stripping. But they, that, people tell me all the time, well, burlesque isn't stripping, right? They didn't actually remove anything. It's just like pretty costumes. And so and I think that that's what I mean by the gentrification of it. And maybe that is the popularization of it as well. But to me, it's the really cleaning it up, just looking, just looking at feathers and corsetry, right? Yeah, I can see what you mean, that it's, it, it's, it lacks the, the raunchier elements of, mm -hmm. um, of some of these other categories that you're, that you're talking about. But it's quite interesting that that gentrification and popularization mm -hmm. would go together. Yeah, I think it's important within that because they were marginalized before, right? Yeah. If they're the strippers of the day, and now we're putting it into a PG-rated film. Yeah, yeah. They, it really needs to be that. Yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. I was going to say, we'll take one last question, and then I think we'll move on to the next presenter. I feel like there's yes, probably more to say, but do, do <coughs> this is really more of a little comment yeah. rather than a question. I'm just thinking about how. The, um, the neo burlesque that I've seen um, is much more. I, it seems to come out of um, out of postmodern dance, basically, the, and more the performance art framework that, that you're referring to. And the the one what it seems to bring together is the the sense of humor about bodies that um, that's become a full part of postmodern dance and. And also, because there's such a proliferation of community in dance over the last mm -hmm. number of years, that it seems to be more involved with those values and questions and so on than with um, just refiguring out uh, where stripping lies. In, Do you, so you're saying that, that, the, that comedy is what ties in? Not only together? comedy, but, but in a sense of irony and And, and kind of assuming, I guess, in what it might be in part is known who your audience is, so that the audience that is very likely to show up at a neo burlesque circumstance or venue is likely to be a, a postmodern dance audience coming with that yeah. array of, of information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, comedy is often used as the main thing to distinguish the two. Mm -hmm. That's a very common argument. If you ask a lot of, um, if you ask a lot of neo burlesque performers what the what's the similarity between what they do and what women did in the 1950s, they'll almost always say comedy. And we were just discussing today, but if you. <laughs> Yeah, if you look at a lot of, if you go to strip shows, often you will have comedy involved. I mean, it depends where you are, but you will have the women like smacking themselves and like making jokes about it. So it's hard to use that as, I mean, we know that there are, of course, distinctions and things. It's very hard to articulate. Um, yeah, I didn't mean so much that, the, that it was funny or not funny, oh, okay. but more that, um, I, I guess, I mean, I've never thought about this before, Frank. I was just thinking about what your relation, what the performer's relationship to the audience is and what the audience is likely to know. Um, and probably the audience at a strip show, a more traditional strip show, would be a different audience from the New York show. Absolutely. Okay, we'll take you in there. Thank you so much, Kevin. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.